Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar on the international perspective of VCA. This webinar is the fourth session in a multi-webinar series on VCA for the transplant community, the need and the achieved debunking the myths. This webinar series is presented by the AST Vascular Composite Allotransplant Advisory Council. Before we begin the main presentation, we have a few housekeeping notes to help you engage with today's discussion. Currently, there is a viewership polling question displayed on your screen. Please take a moment to answer this question while we finish the remaining announcements. This webinar is being recorded and the archive will be available on the AST website next week. Please note that all of your lines have been muted so that only the presenters can be heard for the archive recording. If you have any questions for our panelists during the webinar, we encourage you to participate by using the questions section on the Zoom webinar panel at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions for consideration. Please note that any questions submitted via the chat section may be missed during your presentation. Fi finally, the, at the conclusion of today's webinar, there will be a short survey that will appear on your screen and in the, pasted in the chat. Please fill out the survey to help us keep our content current and engaging. I will now turn the session over to our moderator, Dr. Linda Sindalis, to begin our presentation. Thank you, Rafaela, and welcome everyone. We are here today for a real treat uh, with three international leaders in VCA who will share with us not only their experience, but also an update on different topics that they've been talking about and different VCA types. So um, it is my great pleasure to start with uh, Dr. Patrick Lassus. Uh, Dr. Lassus is a plastic and reconstructive surgeon and he's the head of the Department of Plastic Surgery in Helsinki University Hospital in Finland. His main clinical focus is in facial and head and neck reconstruction surgery. He is the leader of the Finnish facial allotransplantation program with two phase transplantations, one in 2016 and the second one in 2018. He is currently the secretary and treasurer of the International Society of Vascularized Composite Allotransplantation. Welcome, Patrick. We look forward to your talk. Thank you, Linda. And thank, thanks for the organizers for this kind invitation for me to present my uh, uh, to give my pre presentation. Uh, so, one second, I hope you can see my slides now. So, uh, so I'm a, I'm a, I'm a facial surgeon from Helsinki. I've been doing, I'm a plastic surgeon, but I've been treating patients with facial problems for more than 15 years. So that's my, that's my, my focus. Uh, I'm going to be talking about two different things uh, today. It's, it's a short, two short presentations, but they link it together. Uh, and I think it's the idea is that it's now more than 20 years from the first uh, face transplantation, uh, hand transplantation, and more than 15 years from the first uh, face transplantation. And I think it's about the time to start to to sort of see where we are going, what has happened, and, and where we are going. So I start with the with the current status, and this first part. Whoops, let me see if I can move it. Yeah. So the first part is focused in Europe, and and this. Uh, slides are kindly given me by Dr. Emmanuel Morello from Lyon. So, there, there have, VCAs have been performed in ten countries in in Europe so far, uh, and uh, uh, started in in, uh, in France, but also then then uh, in Finland we did the first phase transplantation in two thousand and sixteen, uh, and and. Um, it's more than 20 years, but still there are quite, quite not, not so many uh, centers that are performing these, these treatments. And as you can see, there are several different types of, of VCAs, such as upper, upper extremity or face or larynx or abdominal wall. And, and I think we can still see that we are very in, in the very beginning of, of this uh, VCA era, since there are about 20 centers altogether so far that has performed some type of VCA uh, so far. And I think it's, it's been driven by this, uh, somebody who's been very enthusiastic in, 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 in uh, developing these programs. Uh, uh, and we're not still yet seeing the, the sort of like a rise in numbers. And I think there are many reasons for that. But one reason is, is that it's very burdensome to, to start these programs. And also uh, for the legislation in many countries, it might be difficult 
uh, to pull it through. Uh, most of the countries have one or two centers, but then the, in France and, and Spain, there are, there are five centers altogether that have performed some type of, of VCA. How, how are these categorized then? Then when we started in Helsinki in 2011, at that time, there was no, uh, there was no legislation for, for face transplantation. I contacted the, the health minister of Finland. I said that we are planning to, to start a face transplant program. And then, then they said that, okay, how do we categorize it? And they were still thinking that whether it's a tissue transplant or, or, or an organ transplant. And then they waited until 2013 when the EU commission made a, made a uh, suggestion that it should be uh, uh, categorized as, as uh, organ transplant in, in EU countries. And after that, they very quickly uh, uh, categorized face transplantation or, or VCAs uh, to be, uh, to be uh, uh, organ transplants, which of course made, made life much easier than, than we could build up the program. And it took us altogether five years before we were ready to start to enlist our first, first patient. However, in, it, it's not the same in every country. Europe, there are a lot of small countries in Europe and this the EU, uh, they can only give recommend, recommendations, and it, it's it's uh, categorized differently in different countries. Uh, in mo in about half of the countries, it's considered standard of care, as in 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 Finland. When we started, we we had the option to to either apply for a, a, a exper experimental procedure status, sort of like research program, or a standard of care program. And we decided to go for the for the standard of care. And the idea was that if we would get that status it would make life much easier and it would be more uh, reliable in the future if, 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 it, if these were considered standard of care programs. And, and that was, it took us two years of, of, of negotiation and, and, and discussion with the authorities before we got the status. But it, it does help us because now when, when all BCAs in Finland have been categorized as standard of care, we can proceed with these programs uh, without a risk that, that we will run out of, of funding. But it's not same, not the same in every every uh, European country, and the same goes for funding. Uh, however, in, in most more than half of the of the countries that are, have been performing VCAs, the the funding is uh, from the from the standard healthcare, and and which is of course uh, much safer for these programs. And in some countries, like in in France, upper extremity and face uh, are have been uh, are funded by the standard healthcare. Whereas as uterus and larynx programs are still a national research grant. Uh, and in UK, the upper extremity and abdominal wall are considered standard of care funding. However, they are, if, if I'm correct, it's, it's not still, uh, they are not still able to do face transplantations. So there's a lot of variation in these countries. How much does this cost then? We calculated the, the, the real cost for face transplantation for the first year in Finland from, from our two patients. And this is the average of that, and it's it came up something about one hundred and ninety thousand euros for the first year total cost, uh, including all the all the pre-transplant workup and and the surgery itself and intensive care unit and post-op treatment, uh, and uh, but this varies a lot, and I think it uh, and the biggest thing that that changes it is that if you, if the patient needs to have uh, uh, redo surgeries, so th this, then this might be much. The, the amount might, might get much bigger. And, uh, but apparently this is about the same amount of money that face transplantation costs in different countries, uh, even in the uh, United States where, where this is, the situation is very different. Uh, the, the cost is not that much different. And this is of course only Europe uh, and, and uh, the situation in different uh, continents is, is, is different. However, in, in, in Western Europe, so there, at the moment, we have nine countries with active clinical programs, uh, and it's considered standard of care in six, country, six countries, and uh, in uh, three countries, it's only experimental procedure, and, and in three countries, some of the VCAs are considered as standard of care and some experimental procedures. And it's covered by national health system in uh, some parts, at least in most of these countries. And I think, uh, which is a good thing, uh, funding is not a limitation. For the for the future of VCA in, in West, Western Europe, because it's based on on the, on the national uh, healthcare funding. Uh, moving to another other part of this this presentation, uh, it's about the, the current status of of face transplantation. 
I just gave a talk in Cancun in, in ISBCA meeting uh, about the, the graft losses in phase transplantation. And I think this is linked to the funding and, and, and the future as well of, of the VCAs or, uh, altogether. And I think it's, it's uh, 17 years from the first phase transplantation, or close to 17 years. And I think it's about, we are getting close to the time that we can see that how these patients are doing uh, as a group. Uh, so far, there, there are still only, most of the, the publications that are from phase transplant patients, they are, they are on uh, sort of case reports and very, very small series, but we don't still, still have a, uh, we don't still yet know the, the, the graft half-life and, and things like that. And, and the data I'm, pub, I'm presenting here is not published yet. And this is a very busy slide, but I, I want to put it in here because we can still, uh, I can still put all the phase transplantations that have performed in the world so far into one slide. So it's 49 patients or 49 uh, phase transplantations of 47 patients so far all together, starting in 2005 in France and then the last one in, in France in, in uh, end of 2021. And, and how are we doing then? In, uh, when we consider about the, the, the graft half-life or graft losses. Of these 49 transplants, 13 have been removed so far, or, or the patient has died. And a lot of, reason, a lot of different uh, uh, reasons for graft loss. The, one case was, was such that they, uh, they couldn't do the anastomosis for the, for the face transplant, it was lost immediately. And then there was a case with an early infection and uh, rejection sort of uh, uh, problem that resulted in the death of the patient. Then we have PTLD uh, patients res resulting in, in reduction of immunosuppression and then, uh, then uh, uh, reje rejection problems and so forth. Also uh, carcinomas, uh, there was a oral or cancer patient that had a, a lower jaw, low, lower face transplantation and he developed a pharyngeal carcinoma two and a half years after the, after the transplant. Uh, also, two interesting cases of, of chronic rejection in which both patients were re-transplanted and, and these patients are doing quite okay so far. But 13 grafts have been removed so far uh, of these 49 patients. And if you look at, look at the overall graft survival, five years uh, is 85% for this whole cohort, 49 patients, and 10 years is 71%. However, if you start looking at at, at when uh, uh, is th there is a difference when, when uh, the transplant was done. So I, I, I uh, grouped this in, into five different groups. The first 10 phase transplants, the second 10, the third 10 and so forth. And you can see that, that from the first 10 phase transplantations, seven patients has lost, has either died or lost their graft. But the number of goes down after the first 10. And even the median graft survival time gets, gets uh, for the second 10 is higher than the first, first 10 uh, and, and the third 10 is close to that, close to the first 10, even though it's, they were done much, much later. And, and doing the, the plot for the graft survival, we can see that, that for the first 10, uh, they, they, those patients have been doing much worse than the patients after, uh, after that. And I think this is that we have learned something, the community has learned something, uh, that I, I don't know what, <laughs> many things, uh, but, but we are doing better than, than during the very, very early times uh, in, in phase, phase transplantation. But this, this is all yet uh, unpublished data. Uh, just to end, end my presentation, uh, just to show what we have been doing. Uh, so as Linda said, we, we've done two phase transplantations so far, the first one in 2016 and the second one in 2018, very similar patients. Uh, both had a self-inflicted ballistic injury a long time ago, about 20 years ago, uh, and a lot of conventional surgery. These patients are very, very familiar to us. Uh, for, the first, for the first patient, we, we did uh, six free flaps to try to correct the, the, the functional problems he had, and, and the second patient. Both patients had a lot of infectious problems in their, in their uh, face that we couldn't solve without removing the face. Uh, uh, and, and they were psychologically, we tested them, well, follow, followed them a long time and tested them, and we found them to be very suitable for face transplantation. The first patient re received a lower two-third face, 
uh, and the second patient re received a full face transplantation. Both had a maxilla and mandible transplanted as well, and all oral cavity transplanted. And here we have the first patient. I think I need to start the video. Uh, you can see the pictures from the from the, after one year, three years, five years, and six years. Not much change happening in his his uh, 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 looks. He get, developed this sort of like a, we call it a moon face uh, phenomenon. For, I think it came from the from the high prednisone we used in the beginning, which has not resolved, and he, uh, it slightly affects his mimics. Uh, so that you can see that the movements, the mimical movements on his face, they are sort of like mass movements. Whereas for the second patient, I need to do this. Yep, the second patient is now four and a half years after face transplantation. Uh, he's doing uh, well as well. And uh, uh, he has better mimical uh, movements on his face. He can uh, express uh, one side independent from the other side. There is some synchronous on both patients, but, but this is uh, uh, not disturbing much. It's not disturbing himself. And then uh, and then a little bit busy slide. I'm sorry for this, but I've, I've sort of grouped here the results that we have seen so far. Uh, we've been able for these both patients to, to uh, get function on their mimic muscles so that they are able to express emotions uh, such as anger or fear or happiness, which is of course extremely important for social communication. And the second patient has nearly very, very close to normal smile. Uh, they both have sensation on their face. The first patient, the sensation is on protective, whereas for the second patient, it's very close to normal. And it's people that are not familiar sensation in the face is extremely important, for, especially in, in the lids and the lips. lips. Both patients are uh, competent. They have oral competence, which they didn't have before. They were drooling or they were not able to, to drink normally because if, all the fluid were just running down. Uh, we couldn't improve their eating, uh, unfortunately, but I think that problem was beyond the face transplantation or, or speaking. Uh, the, the second patient was on tracheostomy. Uh, which we could remove, he was some permanent tra tracheostomy that we could remove uh, shortly after the face transplantation. They both have normal nasal breathing. And very importantly, we can see that they, they both have improved uh, quality of life uh, results. Thank you. This was my presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Patrick. This is really a, a great overview. And, and remarkable remarkable patients um, we are going to continue with our uh, second speaker and then we will open the floor for uh, discussion at the end of our third so it's also my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, dr subramaya Ayer, uh, who will be sharing with us as you can see the start of vca in india Dr. Ayer is a professor and chairman uh, of plastic and reconstructive surgery in Amrita Institute in Kashi, which he initiated and is a leading center for upper extremity uh, transplantations in India. Uh, welcome, uh, looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Uh, I will be for sharing. I would, um, th yeah, thank you very much, Linda. And uh, uh, Patrick, that was a great talk about the facial face transplants. I would, uh, I would be just uh, concentrating on uh, the way we, uh, what are the issues in a developing country with regards to reconstructive transplants and how we started and what are the, what is the current, uh, uh, status in our country, uh, which is a, obviously a developing nation. Uh, these are all the transplants. I will come to that. See, the perspective, when I look at it, I have uh, put it across as uh, poor infrastructure, no social security or insurance coverage, lack of governmental regulations and social issues. These are the main broad headings, which I thought that 
that are the issues in our country. Dr. Iyer, uh, this is I, Brian. Dr. Iyer, I apologize for interrupting yeah. you. This is uh, Brian Valeri with AST staff. We can't see your slides, so if you could just try sharing those again, uh, so the presenters, uh, the attendees, can see them properly. We apologize. I'm sorry. Um, it should be a green share screen button at the bottom of your Zoom control panel. Oh, let me. I, I thought I shared it. it. It might just not have gone through. It happens sometimes, unfortunately. We apologize for, you know, Is any inconvenience. Is it okay now? Uh, no, no, no. Um, if, if, um, if you go to your Zoom webinar panel, um, you should see a green share uh, yeah, screen yeah, button. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. Perfect. We apologize for the interruption. To, uh, so sorry. No. Yeah, let me start. Is it okay now? Oh, perfect, Doctor. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much. So, uh, apologies for the uh, interruption uh, delay from my side. See, uh, as I was uh, mentioning, the uh, I would uh, mainly look at the issues in with regards to a developing countries' uh, perspective. What uh, where does the VCS stand? And uh, as I was mentioning, the main issues with a developing nation is the poor infrastructure, no social security or insurance coverage, what uh, Patrick was telling about uh, uh, Euro. Uh, it is absolutely lacking in uh, these regions. Lack of governmental regulations and social issues. Now, we started in uh, 2014, and then we had registered for both Laring, Trakia, and uh, Hand, and then, I would say how we overcome, because it was a first, firstly, it was a totally new thing in the country. And then it was absolutely unheard in the country about uh, uh, any of the VCA. So there, uh, when you look at the uh, infrastructure, if you look at it, uh, it's, it's there. You know, you have uh, institutions that are capable in our country. Uh, any, any institution which does a, a transplant should be able to do a VCA to support the VCA program. What I'm meaning is that it's not doing a VCA, can support the VCA program in, in, in a general aspect. The, uh, we see, we when we started, we had experience hand and microsurgeons, orthopedic support, transplant team was, our center was quite good in transplant. So we had all the backups for the transplants and then rehabilitation of physiotherapy was available. And then the issue about uh, uh, VCA, since it was new, it was sort of, uh, you know, our immunology knowledge was minimal. So we thought we should follow, we have a close license with our nephrology team, because when you look at the uh, transplant immunology uh, management, nephrologists uh, fit in the best to advise. So we thought, even though there are different ways of uh, Cross matching, CDC cross match, which is the universal practice in our country. We adopted that. And then we again had uh, discussions about the induction and uh, uh, in a maintenance regime, again followed what was practiced in nephrology. It made us much more easier for us to tackle the issues also in future. Even now, our, our nephrology team is partly become a transplant immunology team. We all work together and we are also much better than before uh, before we started. Still, it helped a lot to you know, start off our program. And um, this is the greatest problem in, the, in our country and in any developing nation that the social security or insurance coverage is uh, hardly existing. So when you're looking at the uh, way, you know, the Europe and uh, you say, uh, other developed nations are uh, can still do, we have to rely on uh, our own resources, the patient's own resources, or we have to create resources from other channels for both the procedure and the immunosuppression. The other issue was there was no guidelines or policy from, uh, no policy directives from the government. So what we went up across was to look at, at uh, as, uh, you know, there is a close, it was a, even the latest transplant uh, Act, it doesn't say about the VCA, but there is something like a, or other organs. So we looked at that and then got a certification on that category of other organs. Hands became other organs and we got listed. And 
the next obstacle even now which is there is the difficulty in getting donors uh, you know the organ donation rate is very very poor in our country even though of last uh, five years it has picked up because of the uh, because of the work of lot of voluntary agencies and government support still it is quite lacking and whenever it comes to a vc i don't think we can even imagine of a face donation now even hand is so difficult but it is picking up but then it is a problem and so again religious beliefs social bonding all those things make a mutilating donation very difficult in our country and poor compliance to treatment is a big problem because of the distances money also and when we thought about it we thought that we should stick to bilateral hands because it was easier to get a sort of permissions and get it uh, uh, accepted by the community when a when a patient with a bilateral hand loss is shown uh, there is no question that they have to be helped even though uh, unilateral hand would have been easier so we stuck to the policy and we are stick, still sticking to that uh, so that the social acceptance is good and this was our track record uh, from that time we have done 11 patients in uh, 21 hands because one was a bilateral loss but we could uh, we transplanted both hands but uh, one of them uh, was uh, one of them had to be explanted the next day so it makes um, uh, 11 patients in our thing i will just go through few uh, issues which came out of this 11 uh, cases and uh, what is it uh, why is it important in our country's perspective the first patient is doing extremely well 7 years is a transplant counselor with us and the second patient was uh, again doing uh, distal hands did well in our series and this second patient went back to army got killed in any enemy ambush uh, now uh, i would just uh, briefly mention in few slides the problems we met with some patients the third patient has chronic rejection he still having the hand there is issues is uh, mainly because of the finance and the uh, educational background was not very good so uh, and then he stopped this immunosuppression on based on a religious preachers advice that nothing is uh, going to go wrong so he uh, you kept off the thing and he has a problem now now uh, the uh, 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 the case four we had a we had a case of ptld in hand but that patient was well to do and could be supported but if i imagine the ordinary patient with a ptld or cmv infection uh, it will be very difficult to handle in a situation because of the cost so that has to be borne in mind the case 6 had an immediate explant because this patient's uh, hand was brought from far off so uh, the long ischemia time was a problem case 7 was something again very Very, very, very serious to consider. She, the, the lady, had a, a, a quadruple and amputee. She had, she died in a POD five because of probably ATG induced cytokine storm. It was treated, but then suddenly uh, picture changed into a, a, sepsis, a feature of sepsis. She was a quadruple amputee, and then so these are the bad things which happened. but most of mostly we would say that we have been encouraged by the results and then what we did further was that see in developing countries it's extremely bad once we started the program we have been getting patients from all over the country and numerous numbers the numbers are huge the people with the bilateral hand losses or unilateral hand losses are numerous so uh, again the problem with us is that see they have to come and stay Uh, near our hospital in our place for one year or one and a half years is uh, not a very easy thing they don't have a social support and the cost if you look at it i've just put it the cost it is not very expensive in india if you look at it from the us rates or european rates it's uh, it's relatively very cheap but for an indian general person it is extremely expensive still and then we encourage other centers to take it and so i'm glad to say that we have Uh, about uh, five more centers which have started uh, two in government sector so were it is totally free jipmer did three patients free of cost and kem mumbai mumbai vinita puri did one case totally free of cost rest is and stanley also so three 
three government institutions and two private institutions have taken. There are more in the offering. And uh, so in 15, this was the scene. Whereas in uh, now in 22, we are quite happy that people have caught up and then uh, they are doing extremely well. Uterine transplants, Dr. Puntam Vekar in uh, Mumbai has been a very uh, sort of solid leader in this field. He has developed, uh, uh, he did the first laparoscopic harvest in the world and then his track record has been extremely good and few other centers. And the next one was abdominal wall transplants along with the intestinal one, couple of cases done in Chennai. And we did one tracheal transplant, which the, in, uh, in uh, about four years back, the patient uh, survived only for it is a cancer, uh, adenocystic carcinoma, and she survived only for about six, uh, you know, two months. Now, lastly, issues and solutions for India in a, as a developing country, Transport of an organs is extremely difficult even in our country. Like state to state is, it's easy. Within the state, it's, you know, you have to uh, road traffic and uh, green corridors and all. Still, it is difficult. You can get it done, but the transport of organs is still a problem. Preservation of organs is also another issue as well as availability of donors. That would be the, uh, that would be the greatest problem, I would say. We, yeah, we see now the government has taken up uh, 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 steps to use regular airline transfers, facilitating that, and helicopter ambulance have been uh, tried, and it will be uh, quite a uh, welcome uh, change from the government. And uh, preservation, like hemp to life, we use a couple of times, and extracorporeal perfusion also we tried, but I'm sure it is not uh, still a standard of care. And availability of donors. We have been trying to promote with our sort of uh, uh, hand transplant being publicized so well. We have been trying that as a medium to promote organ donation. Something like this happens every time. You know, this is a guard of honor for a donor, uh, you know, uh, high hand donor. So these things and the uh, invaluable support from the NGOs probably will make uh, hand donation better in the country. And then I'm sure there is a big growth for multiple uh, centers coming up because the number of people when, uh, requiring hand transplants is quite high. So I would say these are the priorities in our country, bilateral hands and abdominal walls. And uh, maybe face, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about it, how far it will be possible or how much we are justified with the resources we have. But still, there are a lot of candidates who are eligible for face transplant. So I'm sure with the help of the government, we'll do better. Thank you very much. Thank you and very I'm much, Dr. Ayer. I mean, the challenges were very clear, but also the accomplishments. So congratulations. It's, uh, it, it's quite an experience. And we look forward to the, you know, to the discussion. Let me uh, introduce uh, our third speaker, uh, Dr. Natalwala. Uh, Dr. Natalwala is a hand and upper extremity transplant fellow working with Professor K at Leeds General Infirmary in the United Kingdom. He has completed his plastic and reconstructive surgery training as well as a British diploma in hand surgery. During his fellowship, he has been a core part of the team performing bilateral hand and upper limb transplants in December of 2021 and in March of 2022. Uh, welcome and we look forward to your presentation. Thanks very much, Linda. So I'd like to present today the UK hand and upper limb transplant perspective. Uh, no declarations. So the need for hand and upper limb transplant. Well, a hand and upper limb transplant is an effective and appropriate treatment. As you can see here on the right, these are the videos of the first patient that we transplanted in the UK. And you can see that the transplanted hand looks and functions much like a normal hand. The hand moves with strength, dexterity, it is warm to touch, and it heals when it's injured. Patients report an improved self-image. One patient really described as feeling whole again once he'd had his transplant. They improve psychological well-being and improvement in their social function. 
also they're better with their activities of daily living and the vast majority are able to return back to work. Prostheses have always previously been the standard of care. However, the true rate of rejection of prosthesis is actually unknown. Although one study by Abidus et al. in 2007 suggested that 26% of adults and 45% of children and adolescents are dissatisfied with a prosthesis and ultimately reject them. The lifetime cost of a prosthesis is also very variable. And bionic prosthesis, such as this one, the hero arm that's shown here, there are you know, massive steps forward in what we've got already, but there are still there are limitations in terms of weight and um, in terms of a number of channels to actually power the prosthesis. All in all, the choice and autonomy should mean that hand organ transplants should be offered to our patients in a very select group. So the Leeds first hand organ transplant happened in 2012. Back in 2010, we decided to do these hand transplant cases at risk financially. What that means is that there was no guarantee that we'd be able to potentially recuperate the cost of the transplant. And uh, in 2012, um, this was our first pay patient. He was a 54-year-old publican. He lost almost all of his function in his right hand. He had a background of severe gout, and after a severe infection of the right wrist, he had a very stiff, non-functioning right hand, but he also had a very, very poor functioning left hand. And you can see here that having had his transplant three years on, he was able to demonstrate remarkable dexterity with his fingers and use of intrinsic muscles. And again, at four years, you can see here, he's able to do very fine motor skills. So following on from our first transplant, the, the highly specialized services were required to then become centrally funded. So this was by NHS England, who would then fund the entire service. And the, there would be a single organ recruitment organization, which could be NHS blood and, tra and transplant. And the, the service would be delivered from a single center by a hub and spoke model. So as you can see here on the diagram on the right, so Leeds is the single center and for hand and upper limb transplant. And the red lines represent patients that we've already transplanted, who've gone back to their homes. So as far as sort of Glasgow and Bristol, and some have been closer to home in Leeds, York, and Manchester. And then the blue lines represent the patients that are currently either waitlisted or about to be waitlisted. So you can see that the patients are coming from all over the country. It's important to note, to note also that Oxford is also a VCA center, but it's more for uh, abdominal wall transplant and Leeds is the center for hand and upper limb transplant. So in order to get the service up and running, Back in um, 2012, after our first transplant, when everything changed in terms of the commissioning, we had to submit a proposal to the Red Disease Advisory Group. This group is largely composed of members of the Royal College of Surgeons, um, from uh, commissioners, from representatives of patients uh, and doctors, and also um, eth ethicists, geneticists, a wide variety of people. The Rare Diseases Advisory Group then recommends to the Highly Specialized Services Committee uh, which um, hospital should obtain the licensing or the commissioning to actually deliver the service and the funding uh, and the whole setup. It was a very competitive uh, bidding process because a, a center has to be identified to be able to deliver this um, highly specialized service. So we put together a, a proposal for this and, um, and exactly how it would all run together. And we were successful in our commissioning. It took a couple of years in lobbying, but in 2016, we finally got the commissioning to um, be the center for hand and upper limb transplants. We don't have any plans for face transplantation and we and, and leads we don't do abdominal wall, but that is done in Oxford. So what does it cost? In the UK, the costs are actually very similar to that in Europe. So it's approximately 178,000 pounds for each transplant. And it's the same cost whether it's a unilateral transplant or a bilateral transplant. And uh, following the first year, the cost of the medications is somewhere in the region of five to six thousand pounds every year. The other costs, for example, follow up with the renal transplant physicians um, or the orthopedic surgeons are then reverted back to the local services from where the, the patients live closer to home. After the commissioning change um, in 2016, seven of our patients uh, were then transplanted. And six of these patients, it was via the funding from NHS England. One patient 
who uh, was actually funded by legal compensation as his injury occurred at work. So this is our cohort of patients who've had their transplants at Leeds. We've operated on eight patients and done 14 limbs. So the first patient I've already talked about, who's 52 years old at the time, back in 2012, he was a unilateral transplant, uh, distal forearm level. And then there was a break in the program whilst the commissioning changed and the funding changed. And then we finally were able to restart the program in 2016. The second patient that we operated on was a bilateral a partial hand transplant. So this gentleman had a, a caught his hands in a press at work. In order to preserve the length of the amputated limbs, he had bilateral PIA flaps done. And uh, following that, he had bilateral partial hand transplants and he's done exceedingly well uh, up till now. The third patient, uh, unfortunately, uh, sustained amputations uh, at the level of the elbows uh, from a blast injury. And our fourth patient, was a lady who had severe sepsis and uh, was a quadrimembral amputee. On the right side, it was a very distal amputation, but on the left, it was a proximal amputation. And uh, she had a history of ulcerative colitis and she had uh, a very high output stoma. And these presented unique challenges in themselves because of the previous history of dialysis and recurrent AKIs. So renal function has been a great challenge uh, for us to manage. Patient five was very interesting. He's a young gentleman who had a traumatic amputation of his right arm at a very proximal transhumal level. He had a background history of Sturge Weaver syndrome. And uh, I'll talk about how his medications were a challenge uh, postoperatively a little bit later on. Patient six was a lady again uh, who had uh, sepsis and became a quadrimembral amputee. She was very unique in this in that she had pulmonary aspergilloma actually prior to her hand transplantation and uh, she underwent a right upper lobectomy and six months of uh, postoconazole treatment in order to be able to actually have a transplant. So it just showed her enormous dedication and uh, will to have the transplant surgery. And then more recently, in a world first, we did a bilateral hand transplant on a patient with scleroderma. And this is a chap who was on 170 milligrams of uh, oxycodone twice a day, every day, due to the severe pain he had in his hands. And uh, we'll, you will see a video of him a little bit later on. And he describes how he's now essentially pain-free having had a transplant, which is a remarkable achievement for him. And then finally, our most recent patient who had an electrocution injury five years ago, um, had a bilateral hand and forearm transplant in March of this year. So later on this year, we will have six patients that will be waitlisted, five adults and one child. And uh, it's a remarkable opportunity for um, the patient, our pediatric patient, because he's already had a renal transplant in, uh, in, in the last year, following an episode of sepsis and renal dysfunction. So uh, he, he's an ideal candidate. He's a very stoic chap, um, and he's highly committed to the program. With regards to immunosuppression for our patients, they all receive alum 2 survivor and methylprednisolone on induction. Following the transplant, then they commence tacrolimus, mycophenolate, mofetil, and prednisolone. As we'll see on the next slide, in our earlier patients, we experienced a higher number of uh, acute rejection episodes, and therefore we modified our protocol to start them on a slightly higher dose prednisolone than perhaps we would do, for example, solid organ transplant. So now patients initially start on 60 milligrams once a day, and then they're rapidly titrated down um, to have a maintenance dose of anywhere between sort of 5 and 15 milligrams daily. Two patients did require to be briefly on serolimus and tacrolimus uh, because of their high number of acute um, rejection episodes. That was patients one and three, but now they are stable. And uh, one patient, patient five, we had to change medication to cyclosporin because very interestingly, the tacrolimus was causing angiogenesis of his vascular malformation um, as part of his third weaver syndrome. And that led to numerous episodes of seizures postoperatively. And that was you know, quite a challenge um, to understand what was happening. And a couple of patients who required either parsoconazole or rifampicin therapy postoperatively uh, had difficulty with getting tacrolimus levels in range. So that's another challenge of um, immunosuppression in these patients. So with regards to rejection, well, we have a 100% graft survival rate and no patient has had any chronic rejection. Patient seven is our only patient who's had a de novo donor-specific antibody C. And you can see here in grade one rejection, there's been very few episodes. The most common has been grade two, seen in the vast majority of our patients. 
grade three rejection has only really been seen in our first patient and grade four only really in our, in our third patient. And overall, as we can see, the numbers of acute rejection episodes have declined. Our, our first patient probably had the highest numbers and patient six is done remarkably well. She only had one episode of rejection, but she admits that this was around the time of New Year's when she may not have been as compliant with her immunosuppressive medications um, as she normally is. And actually, since that, that episode two years ago, she's not had any further episodes. With regards to further procedures, the vast majority of our patients do require some form of wound revision and closure with or without the need for split thickness skin graft soon after the operation. Um, one of our patients, our most recent, did actually have a periprosthetic fracture, which uh, required a revision RF. He also required washout and infected seroma. Unfortunately, some of the bone samples grew staph epidemis, so he was treated with IV antibiotics for six weeks to treat deep bone infection. Also, we've seen uh, two, three patients with fungal infections, one of which was actually a life-threatening mucromycosis infection that required a radical debridement, wide excision, and a free flap reconstruction also systemic antimicrobials for six months. And then later on, patients may come back for flap thinning or exchange of metal work and miscellaneous procedures such as excision of skin cancer or retinolysis or tendon rebalancing procedures. So this is a summary of our um, cases with their most severe episodes of infection or sepsis. So the green dots represent all viral infections, the black dot represents all fungal infections, and the red dots represent pneumonias, both community-acquired and hospital-acquired. As I mentioned, patient two, whose photographs are shown up here on the top right, he had this lesion in the photo aspect of the right distal forearm, which we biopsied, and this showed a mucromycosis infection. And there was approximately, with this infection, a 50% risk of mortality. So after a detailed discussion with our uh, micro mycologists, we decided to do wide excision and free flat reconstruction. And he's made a full recovery since then and has had excellent function. With regards to COVID-19, one patient uh, actually had a what, he what is described as a rejection episode after the first vaccine. He developed a rash um, on the transplanted hand, but this quickly settled down on its own accord. All our vaccinated, uh, all our patients are fully vaccinated. Four of our patients had confirmed COVID-19. We actually did require hospital admissions, and one our uh, patient five required, sorry, patient six requires subtroma valve and malnuvaprevir in order to prevent her going into an acute kidney injury on top of a chronic kidney disease. And one patient has suspected COVID-19, but the most important thing is that they all made a full recovery. Side effects of our medications, three out of five patients, three out of eight patients did actually go on to develop a type two diabetes. And uh, in terms of renal function, you can see here that at the beginning, most of our patients had a very, very good renal function. But as we go on, you can see here patients four and six who are patients with renal sepsis, so with sepsis and renal dysfunction at the time of their uh, sepsis and uh, amputations, they actually um, have very, very poor renal function. So patient four had a severe, community, a severe chest infection immediately post-operatively and uh, never really fully regained her renal function since then. So at the moment, we're discussing whether some of these patients who have renal sepsis are polymembal amputees, whether we should be thinking of an early switch in mTOR inhibitor or belatacept um, if there are any signs of acute rejection. And then finally, moving on to outcomes for our patients, the hand is an incredibly complex organ. It has numerous functions from sensation uh, to aesthetics, to touch, feeling complete psychologically, mechanical precision, communication, and no one measurement outcome can truly capture the, the true function of the hand. So for this reason, in our trust, we use the cup m which we feel is the most appropriate measurement as the outcomes are tailored directly to the patient's functional goals. But we do measure um, things like the DASH scores and the HSS scores. So looking at the DASH scores, five out of six patients improved over time. Two of our patients, seven and eight, are too recent to have had their um, one year DASH score outcome. Um, but you can see here patient number three, initially his function declined a little bit, but it has actually increased um, over the last few years. Most importantly, moving on to the COPA performance scores, you can see here that all our patients did actually um, increase their scores, although patients three and five are marginal improvements. When it comes to satisfaction, they were all um, satisfied with their outcomes. 
all of our patients were glad that they had the transplants. None of them um, had any sort of psychological rejection from them. And I'd like to just play this video of um, our patient who had scleroderma by the bilateral hand transplants. And um, this was his quote that, I look forward to waking up in the morning now because I have something to look forward to. Spending time with my girls and wife pain-free now has made such a difference to me and my family. Without you, basically, I would still be lying in my bed in a lot of pain um, with my hands curled up and unable to use them. So it's made such a difference to my life since the operation. So going forward, one of the challenges is that um, vascular composite ala transplantation is still not actually on the ODR list. So the families of the donors have to specifically give that consent at the, at the time. And um, this can be a barrier to um, finding suitable donors for hand transplantation. So that is one of our aims is to get BCA and hand transplant specifically on the ODR list. And also our catchment area, as you can see here, is quite small. It's limited to the Northeast, Northwest and, and North Wales. And we would like to expand this going forward. We'd also like to expand our patient cohort um, because we have a patient or a child who we would like to list for bilateral transplants. We'd also like to be doing unilateral um, transplants in select cases. And as you can see with um, our patient scleroderma, loss of function through disease needs to be a, um, an indication as well for hand transplants, as well as proximal levels. So thank you very much for listening and I welcome any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Atarwala, uh, really incredible experience. So uh, let's just go ahead and um, start our uh, discussion session. We, uh, I'm gonna start with questions from uh, the audience and then I have a couple of questions for all of you as well. So uh, one question is uh, for Dr. Atarwala. Did the patient with de novo DSA, was that the patient who needed to be on serolimus for a period of time? Uh, no, so that patient who had the de novo DSA, he was patient number seven. He was the one with the scleroderma who had the bilateral uh, distal hand transplants. Um, so this is, is interesting. We noticed that one specific DSA um, very early on in his treatment. So he had his the operation December, just in, uh, in early January, he has showed signs of that DSA. And I think partly it, it was a little bit challenging getting his tacrolimus levels in range early on. And um, once we did actually manage to do that and get him into appropriate range, those levels quickly tailored off. And more recently, um, in the last four to six weeks, we did see um, a little bit of an increased number in MFI of that DSA antibody, but it's gone down again with um, his uh, immunosuppression being in range. Thank you. And another question for you, uh, for Dr. Ayer. Could you uh, elaborate or tell us about the causes of bilateral upper extremity amputations in India and the UK? Dr. Ayer, would you like to start? Yeah, yeah. Um, majority of the cases are uh, uh, what we found is the electrocutionizing. See, there are a lot of high tension lines and then uh, not really uh, sort of uh, the security warnings or people use iron sort of things for plucking things, you know, plucking roots and all those things. Those are the main, one main reason is that, uh, that is contact with high tension uh, electric wire. Uh, second one is accidents, road traffic as well as train accidents. These are the two main reasons. Thank you. Dr. Uh, so I think in our cohort series, it, it's quite small, it's only eight patients, but um, the bilateral transplants uh, or the etiology has been either trauma. So, for example, the patient uh, number two who had his hands trapped in a steel press at work, or it's um, sepsis, you know, so either influenza sepsis or streptococcus sepsis and their quadrimembral amputees from that point of view. And um, the slide that I showed with our patients, the six patients that are going to be listed, and a, quite a, um, a not large number of those patients are actually sepsis patients with bilateral upper limb loss. Um, and then obviously we've got um, patient number seven as well who had um, scleroderma. So we had to amputate his native hands and then simultaneously do transplant for those. So I think it's a wide etiology, um, but probably predominantly sepsis actually looking at our current cohort and 
our um, waitlisted cohort. Thank you. I actually have a question for, for each of you, and perhaps I, um, I'm going to start with Dr. Lassos. Uh, and it's the same question for the three of you. So the three of you have clearly established successful programs in your countries under different challenges, different circumstances, uh, different areas, uh, geographically as well as, you know, uh, infrastructure, socially, uh, governmental, et cetera, et cetera. Well, if somebody comes to you, what would each of you tell people who are looking to establish transfer programs or VCA programs of what to do and what not to do based on your experience? Let me start with that, Patrick. You mean by starting a, a new program? Yes, a new program. What would you tell them what to do and what not to do? I think, well, in Finland, it's easy because uh, by law, we have only one transplant center. So no one, it has to be done in Helsinki. But in other countries, I think I, I'm really bit pro for centralizing things. So I think in such early, early times of, of VCAs, I don't think we should have too many centers at, at, at the same time. We sort of build up these programs and then and slowly increase, increase the number. But I think if somebody's building up a new program, it should be done in a center with very, very uh, good quality transplant uh, center, because this is trans transplant surgery and the problems are related to transplant surgery. Of course, for rehab rehabilitation it, for, for hands or face, it's, it's, it's a different thing, but that's not so crucial. It's crucial for the success, but it's, it's still not crucial for, for graft survival. So I think it should be done in a big center uh, with, the, with the team, big, big enough team, so there are enough experts to cover all the problems that will come during the journey. What not to do, Patrick? I think not to rush because I, in my opinion, I think there are some cases that have been lost due to patient selection. So I think you should find the right patient, especially who's uh, committed and, and, and uh, compliant ready to, to follow up all the instructions and take the medications and all the follow-up. I think this is, this is the crucial thing to, to choose the right patient and not to rush just to, to start a program. Thank I think you. we've seen that in some places. Dr. Ayer, what to do and what not to do? Yeah, I would uh, agree partially to Patrick, what Patrick said and disagree to what he said. First of all, partially. centralized thing is, yeah, you know, the centralized thing is not possible in India. But India needs more more centers because it's uh, it's the peculiarity of the country. You know you cannot uh, so and the population and the problem needs more centers. Uh, the other thing which he to, uh, told is exactly true. Like patient selection is much more important in our situations where patient and the family supports the whole problem. Uh, the whole program. So uh, it has to be very meticulously selected patients. And then uh, we always suggest that don't jump into uh, this for the sake of doing it, but we need it and you get prepared. And then everybody is now the good part in India is that few centers which have been doing, have been working together. No, like uh, Mumbai, you know, a couple of our team members went and uh, Chennai also, we went, you know, a couple of weeks. There was have been a mutually sort of uh, helpful to each other. Uh, uh, other thing we always, I would like uh, our uh, newer centers, I would advise them always is to have the best sort of record keeping as well as have a general, you know, a, form a national policy which we are doing, which are trying to do for uh, procure, uh, everything, allocation and uh, procurement and uh, report of results. We are trying to do that, but again, that is something which has to come from all the centers who are participating. Thank you. Dr. Natalwala, and I have another question from the audience. So what to do and what not to do? So I very much agree with um, both Dr. Lassus and uh, Dr. Iyer that I think that the most important thing really is, um, is collaboration and teamwork, because uh, in this sort of um, you know, uh, transplant service. In the UK, we're a small um, sort of, you know, country, but we still work with several different hospitals 
And, uh, you know, I think we have an excellent relationship with them. We have excellent communication. We're all sort of emailing each other and just checking up and seeing how patients are getting on. And I think that's the key because there's so many things that happen after transplant that you could not expect or predict. And um, it's useful. And also sometimes you don't know what to do with that. And it's good to get different opinions from the local services and, you know, special services leads together and make a plan for those patients. I think really collaboration teamwork is key. And also, again, as we mentioned as well, is patient selection. So I think one of the, the best things is the clinical psychology team, part of the lead hand transplant service, you know, that we spend a minimum of one year with the patient, making sure they're psychologically ready for the transplant. And uh, if there are any sort of red flags, then those are worked through very carefully and discussed with the patient and families very carefully. And it's really important to involve the family as well, because sometimes, you know, you'll have a great family network support now, but that patient may not have that a little bit later on. So we need to have sort of contingency plans in place to, to see how they can be helped later on if there was an issue. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I have one more question from the audience. It is coming to the top of the hour and I need to ask permission to Rafael if I can delete the question or how does she want me to, because it's 12 o'clock and we do want to be respectful with everybody's time. Yes, Linda, of course you can. Um... Thank you. Yeah. Great very brief answer to each of you is this is for all of you very brief the question is are there or what are the critical issues specific to bca that a preclinical animal research could help to address patrick sorry i didn't get the question okay so I the need... question is yeah the question is are there or what are the critical issues specific to DCA that a preclinical animal research could help to address? Ah, uh, <laughs> tough one. I think um, that there is not one one critical. I think we've proven the concept so far already by in, in humans. That's my answer. Short one. Uh, Dr. Ayer. I would say so you trying use of uh, immunosuppressant the safer way. I think we need still more animal studies, especially local delivery and the role of uh, lymphocytes, uh, lymph nodes, and all those things. Uh, that that is uh, that is what I would. Say. Thank you, Dr. Atalwala. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Really, actually, so um, Dr. Grant presented some excellent slides on. Um, some you know breakthrough sort of uh, animal work that he's been doing um, with his team in the US on immunosuppression animal models. So I think really that's a, a strong model for that. Yeah. Great, excellent. Well, I would like uh, to thank everyone uh, of you for your time, for your leadership, uh, for your contributions uh, to the field. Uh, certainly, the AST for hosting this uh, webinar for everyone uh, who participated and who attended today. And I am going to turn it over to Rafael. Thank you, Linda. Um, AST would like to thank our panelists and attendees for today's session. All webinars from this series can be found on the AST website, and the recording of today's session will be posted next week. Please remember to complete the evaluation survey that I have also posted in the chat. And thank you again for joining and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.